Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a vintage comparison video. And, you know, while everyone else in Fragcom uh, feels like they're doing stuff that is gimmicky or, you know, I see these people and they've got super chat songs and it's like a dog and pony show. I mean, it's, uh, it's turned into like a clown show. And that may be great for some people, but I want my channel to be more on the intellectual side of things. You can still have fun, but I want it to focus on some real information, you know? And even if this video only gets one view, I don't care. I want this to be the type of content that my channel puts out. And I want it to be different. And I want it to be, um, you know, I want it to be meaningful to the people who really love fragrances. And, you know, if I don't have graphics coming in and explosions happening and you know, all of this stuff on my channel, and that stops some people from watching my channel. I was talking with Rich Mitch about this the other day. Fantastic. That's great. If that's the kind of thing that will stop you from watching my channel, you're probably in the wrong place anyways, because I want this to be about the information. And so today, uh, and I have to give a special shout out to my good friend Arnold. He sent me a very kind, full, I mean, 5 ml full decant of um, vintage Furio and Jacques Bogart's Furio. Uh, and this is the vintage, and so let me show you the modern. I've got five bottles of this stuff because I got it when it was super cheap. I got five bottles for like 120 bucks shipped. You know, I couldn't say no. And you can see this one's got a little bit of a dent in it. I love this stuff. And the new ones look like this on the front. You can kind of see uh, the the verbiage here. The older ones, the, the vintage bottles down here at the bottom say 80, 85 proof volume. So they have an 85% and then volume is what you'll see down below. You'll see there is no 85 proof here on the on the front. It's a different kind of um, it's a different kind of, of you know marking. And so I've got five bottles of the modern. And so what we are going to do is we are going to compare the vintage, which is actually on my left hand, and the modern, which is on my right hand. And we're going to talk about some of the pros and cons and the differences. And this scent is discontinued, according to Parfumo. However, this version, the one that I've got a bunch of bottles of, you can still find on fragrancebuy.ca for about 28 Canadian dollars. Uh, and that's super cheap. And, and, you know, somebody, I've had a lot of people ask me, hey, I want to get into some of these vintage fragrances. Where should I start? Some of them are very hard to find. Some of the ones I'm going to show today are expensive and hard to find. Um, and this is a fantastic way to kind of, uh, get initiated into masculine vintage perfumery because you can still find bottles of this floating around for so cheap. And it's really, truly a great initiation. Uh, if you've never smelled anything like this, you'll probably be shocked. Uh, you might be taken aback. You might be disgusted. Stay with it. I promise you there is such beauty in this fragrance. I absolutely love this. You know, some people like to wear what they call like calming scents to bed. I like to wear stuff like this to bed. Uh, this is the kind of stuff I like to wear to bed. It's so, it just takes my mind, you know, to a different place. It's an amazing fragrance. And I, it's one of my favorite vintage fragrances of all time. And what's even more crazy, I mean, look at the quality of this. Nice glass bottle. Um, and Jacques Bogart sells these for peanut. I have no clue how in the world Jacques Bogart stays in business with stuff like this. I mean, the value for money on Furio to me is absolutely astronomical through the roof. This could be, if, 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 if the supply wasn't out there where you could just go buy it for 28 bucks, I could easily see people selling this for $300, easily. If it was not as easy to find, uh, you know, and, and people wanted to experience what this offers, easily this could be a $300 eBay you know, um, fragrance from the scalpers. You know, it just is one of those things. So the name, Furio, and I, I put a picture up of the advertisement campaign when it first came out as the thumbnail of this photo. It's fantastic. Uh, I love the whole idea. Uh, rebellion, Parfum Rebellion. And back in the late 80s, um, Japanese culture and, you know, everything about Japan was kind of big. You, Domo Origato, Mr. Roboto, right? That kind of thing. They were uh, they were the up and coming, you know, they were seen as the financial powerhouse in the late 80s. And of course, they had kind of a downfall after that. I think it was the early 90s when they kind of really took a hit financially. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's 
you can see it in kind of the advertising and, and all of that stuff, and it shows in Furio. So apparently, and you can kind of see this, the O at the end almost looks like um, a motorcycle wheel to me or something along those lines. When you see the advertisement on the pack, on the, on the, um, you know, thumbnail, you'll, you'll see what I mean by the motorcycle being part of the advertising campaign. But um, Furyo in Japanese means Japanese prisoner of war, believe it or not. Um, and so it means prisoner of war. Very interesting uh, naming. So we're going to compare the vintage and the modern. So first, uh, I've been wearing these all day, basically. I've done this before, but I haven't worn it as my scent of the day. I've done it where I went to bed and sprayed, you know, one from here, one from here, and just kind of compared quickly. But today I've got to experience the whole dry down. I've been wearing it all day. It's my scent of the day. I'm going to wear it all day. Um, and so let's talk about it. It came out in 1988. And the opening is where you're going to see the instant, one of the biggest discernible differences. And that's that the opening of the vintage smells like a vintage frag to me. And I know that sounds kind of uh, uh, like one of those no-duh no statements, but it does. It, it smells like you're smelling a fragrance from the 80s. Um, whereas the modern, okay, the modern kind of opens up a little bit sharp, a little bit metallic. <sighs> My good friend Thomas from uh, Early Greek says that this is one of the most tenacious fragrances he's ever smelled. And I agree with him. Uh, he made a joke that you could power the eastern seaboard for a week on a bottle of Furio, and it does feel that way. It feels like there is some insane ingredients in here. That's just the way, from, from the way that it smells. But it does smell a little bit more sharp and a little bit more metallic. And you would think that the vintage would actually be the one that um, would be have that animalic civet from the very get-go. If you guys don't know this fragrance, here's the note listing. Ambrette, coriander, bergamot, green notes, and lavender in the top. Carnation, jasmine, cinnamon, geranium, and thyme in the heart. Civet, oak moss, musk, patchouli, amber, vanilla, and vetiver in the base. The civet is what everyone focuses on because these two fragrances get compared because of the civet note, and they very well should. I mean, these are two of the most iconic animalic fragrances from the 80s. Coros um, from 1981 and Furio from 1988. Uh, and of course, there's other animalic fragrances that you could throw in there. But when it comes to civet, if you just said, quick, Ramsey, name two civet fragrances from the 80s to recommend people, it would be these two. I mean, easily, you could just grab these two and you could not go wrong as kind of a representation of the 80s civet note, right? And you get that from the very beginning. But the opening just feels a little bit more um, harsh and metallic, you know, almost like you're smelling. It, it, it feels like... Um, you're smelling those modern synthetics that they kind of used to recreate that opening that weren't available in the 1980s, if that makes sense. And so you would think that the 80s would actually be the one that opens up big and bombastic and in your face, but it's actually the other way around. Uh, the 80s opens up a little bit smoother. Um, there seems to be this space between the notes, if that makes sense. Like you can really smell the green touches, whether, I don't know what green touches it is, whether it's a little bit of Artemisia, Galbanum, or I don't know what, but there's something in here that when you first spray, uh, you'll be able to kind of sniff out space in between the notes. It's like you can walk around them and you can evaluate them. Whereas the opening just kind of feels like a synthetic soup. It feels like a uh, synthetic uh, blend of, of notes that just kind of comes together and it comes off slightly metallic and more synthetic smelling. Okay, so when I say the vintage smells like a vintage, um, that's kind of what I mean in the sense that many vintage fragrances, the ingredients smell much higher quality to my nose. If I just close my eyes and trust my nose, it's the vintage fragrances that smell like they actually have what's said on the bottle. You know, if they say that they use rose, a lot of times you'll smell like you're smelling real rose. There's less tricks, less sleight of hand less magician tricks in the old in the old fragrances. And that's what vintage Furio smells like to me. So the civet is definitely there. Um, however, it's that a uh, little bit more smooth opening. It's not till later on that the civet really ends up taking control of the vintage fragrance heavier than the uh, modern. They kind of do it backwards. They do a, they do a 180 twist. So in the beginning, it's the synthetic opening animalic, you know, um, probably synthetic civet. 
that you're smelling in the very in the opening. And you're probably smelling synthetic civet in both, to be honest with you, but the vintage just smells a little bit more natural. That's the takeaway in the opening. Now, an interesting side note, and there'll be some very interesting little paths we can take with this comparison video, because if you've been following my channel for the longest time, you will know that I have done some comparison videos in the past. The comparison videos are always well received, and um, I did some on some Guerlain fragrances in the past, and Guerlain uh, had to, of course, do some reformulations over the years, as all houses do that have been around for as long as Guerlain. But for example, I compared Coriolan. I should have grabbed the bottle so I could show you guys, but you can go check it out. If you look under my comparison video, um, you know, playlist, you'll be able to easily find it or go to Guerlain and you'll see it's under the Guerlain playlist as well. But, um, uh, I did a comparison between Coriolan and a fragrance called Lame Dune Eros, which came in the Le, Le Parisian's line with that, um, you know, uh, what is it called? That wood frame bottle, if you want to call it that. It looks like wood is around the, the square bottle. Um, and so we compared Coriolan to Lame Dune Eros. And, and recently, within the last month or so, I also compared uh, Vintage Derby. I've got a, 90 a 90s um, Listerine bottle of Derby that I compared to the 2005 re-release in the, in the Le Parisiens line of the Derby that Thierry Vasser worked on with uh, Jean-Paul Guerlain. <clears throat> and so to make it even more interesting, to make this comparison even more interesting, you should know that um, it was Thierry Vasser that actually made Furio. So Thierry Vasser made Furio with one of my favorite perfumers of all time. Uh, his name is Ron... Winograd. The guy is an absolute living legend. Uh, I assume he's still alive. Um, he made, he didn't make the most fragrances, but what he made, every single one I've smelled, every single one, are my, some of my all-time favorites. He made stuff like Lagerfeld Cologne from 1978, uh, and he also made Dunhill's Blend 30 in 1978. He made Furio with Thierry Vasser. He made uh, Roomba for Balenciaga. He made one of my absolute favorite masculines of all time from 1980, Leonard Porhomme. Uh, I, I absolutely adore that stuff. And maybe I don't hear anyone else hyping it and loving it as much as I do. Maybe it's just me, but that fragrance absolutely speaks to me. And he made one other fragrance that I have yet to get my nose on. I want, I'll find a bottle one of these days. It's called Monsieur Leonard. Came out in 1992. So what he's made have been just absolute bang out classics to me. And so he worked on, on Furio with Thierry Vasser, who interestingly enough, uh, also made this in the, in the late eighties. Let me just show you real quick. If you know this, Salvador Dali por Homme, and uh, I will be a little bit of a vintage snob here and tell you that if you're going to buy this fragrance, get the one with the gold frame around the picture on the box. Mark from the Robes 08 channel recently unboxed this and he got the modern bottle, which is fine. But um, if you really want to get a good idea of what this was in the 80s, go for the one with the gold um, around, the, around the picture frame. And there's some similarities here as well. You can see Terry Vosser's frame of mind in the late 80s by comparing this, which came out, I think, a year before Furio. Um, so Terry Vosser, uh, two of my favorite fragrances he's made, by the way, are not with Guerlain, between Furio and Salvador Dali Poron. So the reason it's interesting to me is that in both comparison video cases that I, that I studied, uh, whether it was Coriolan, Derby, they both used this floral concoction to kind of hide some of the changes in the formula to my nose. That, that, that was my assessment. And so if you look at my Coriolan comparison, I said that there were a couple floral notes that he used. One was lemon blossom and one was everlasting flower. And if you look at Derby, uh, which was a brilliant reformulation. Actually, I think Terry Vosser does amazing reformulations personally. Um, in Derby, he used carnation. It feels like that carnation note was really amped up to try to hide some of the downfalls that I think Derby, you know, some of the changes that just had to be made. But it was brilliant, a stroke of absolute brilliance that not enough people talk about because Guerlain, in their infinite wisdom, discontinued uh, Derby 
Now they've just brought it back apparently, but it's like $600 or $500 or something insane I heard. I don't know, I haven't haven't seen the new one or smelled it or anything like that. But um but but yes, just a brilliant reformulation that he made with those two to my nose. I think they're both fantastic fragrances. And even though I have the vintage of both, I had decants of the Le Parisians, you know, newer versions, and so I was able to do those comparison videos. And um it really makes me wonder, whenever I was going through this in my head, smelling these today back and forth all day, and oh God, I love this, by the way. I absolutely love this. I feel so at home wearing these. It's like, it's like coming home. It's like I was away testing all this other shite, and I'm home, you know what I mean, when I get to wear stuff like this. And um, I truly wonder, honestly, I've been thinking about this all day, whether Thierry Vasser had a hand in reformulating this before he became the official in-house perfumer of Guerlain. Is it possible that he worked with Jacques Bogart to um, to reformulate this before, before you know, whether he reformulated his own work? I don't think Ron Winograd would because he stepped away from perfume for a long, long time. He hasn't been in the game for decades by the time this, this reformulation probably had to come around. But in Furio, the reason I think that is because the floral note that feels amped up is rose. Now, there's no rose note listed in, in, in Furio. If you take a look at the bottle though, uh, the, the ruby bottle is actually a pretty good uh, indication of what that rose note smells like in Furio, okay? So, um, what I think he actually did is he amped up the jasmine, the carnation, and the geranium. And geranium can many times give off this rosy-like vibe. In fact, Jean-Claude Elena used geranium in Rose and Queer. There is no rose in, uh, in Rose and Queer. And Frederick Mall was very open to the fact that there was no rose in it. It's not like he tried to hide it and trick us. He was forthcoming about it, you know. It's, and, and that's one of the things that I think makes a good perfumer is the ability to either make you smell something that isn't there or, you know, um, give the impression of something that you think you smell that isn't there. There are these tricks that perfumers play, and that's part of the game. There's nothing wrong with that. I have an issue with when they hide it, when they say that there's Taif Rose in a fragrance and then it turns out there's 0.00001 just so they can legally say it is. I have a problem with that. Um, you know, and in the pictures, of course, they take pictures of the bottles and the Taif Rose is prominently displayed or, you know, uh, all that stuff. But then when, when it's actually evaluated, it's either completely missing and they say, well, it's a Taif Rose Accord that we created. Um, or it's there in the ittiest bittiest amount like they do with Oud, you know. Uh, and so I have a problem with that. And so the amping up the, of the florals, when I smell the, the new one, the modern Furio, compared to the, to the vintage on my left hand, when I smell the new one, the amping up of the florals makes me wonder, you know, I almost want to kind of put the puzzle pieces together and say, did Thierry Vosser have a hand in reformulating his own work? Uh, if he didn't, whoever did this did a fantastic job. They didn't just hand it to some putts, you know. They didn't hand it to some kid straight out of college and had no clue what he was doing. This is a fantastic reformulation. It's brilliant. Um, and if you know my friend Eugene from uh, You Smells Good channel, uh, and if you've been following the channel, of course you have to because his three releases from Les Abstraits I think are some of the best modern. I think for a vintage lover... Les Abstraits is some of the best modern perfume that you will come across because uh, it harkens back to how vintage fragrance used to be done, but in a modern form. So hats off to Antoine Lee for, for creating that trio, and I hope that there is more to come between those two. Um, so you probably know who he is if you've been following the channel, but if you've been living under a rock or if you're new to the channel, you can go to Eugene's YouTube channel and subscribe. You Smells Good is his moniker. Um, and you will know that he actually did a video within the last couple months, maybe three or four months now, I forget. Time seems to fly as you get older. But um, three, four months ago, he did a video on Furio because Al Manzano, if you know Al Manzano, uh, he's joined my channel. I have an interview with Al Manzano you can go check out. Um, and he's joined Eugene's channel many a times. 
uh, he sent him a bottle. Al Manzano sent Eugene a bottle. And Eugene, it was the very first time he got to smell Furio. And I remember distinctly him saying that he was shocked by um, the amount of um, florals. By the amount of florals in the fragrance. He said, wow, this is a vintage masculine, huh? So he was shocked by the amount of florals. Um, and if you remember that, you'll you'll kind of, you can make a mental note or you can go check out Eugene's video on... Uh, on Furio that he uploaded. So you must remember that this is 1988 and you have to take everything into context because in 1988 there was a trend. The trend was to use giant florals in masculine fragrances, almost feminine like florals, in a masculine shell, if you will, and hide those florals using pissy animalic honey or using just animalics in general. A couple examples from the late 80s that you'll know. Number one is Tenere by Paco Rabanne. Thank God I have a 200 mil backup of this. I adore this stuff. This is a Pierre Wagnai creation. Oh, fuck. So if you like the way Boss Number One from, the, from 1985 was created, which um, Pierre Wagnai created Boss Number One in 1985, in 1988, the exact same year that Furio came out, Tenere came out. And this is almost like taking that Boss Number no. 1 animalic honey, but adding it to a huge floral bouquet. Carnation and Lily of the Valley and Jasmine and Oris and all this stuff. Oris roots, kind of powdery, but it's also very pissy. There's cassia and rosemary. The rosemary kind of harkens back to, um, it harkens back to, I would say, the rosemary used in, in Paco Rabanne Pour Homme. Someone left me a comment asking if I would do a this is not a top 10 rosemary video, and I will. I just have to give me some time to kind of put it together. I think it's a great idea. Thank you for the recommendation. Um, but if you like these type of fragrances, you could also check out Marbert Gentleman, which I've talked about on the channel many a times. That's a little bit more musky. The other one that comes to mind, though, when you think about late 80s fragrances for men that have a huge floral note, is a Gerard Anthony creation. It came out in 1987. It came out a year a, a year before Furio in Tenere, and it's Akitos. Now, Akitos is an absolute gem of a fragrance to me, and Gerard Anthony, um, in general, is a, you know, one of my favorite perfumers of all time. Azaro Poron by itself puts him in the pantheon of, you know, greatest perfumers, but then you add this you add things like Balenciaga Porom, Cristobal Porom, and, and it's just, I mean, he's in the entrenched Hall of Fame for me. And this was actually competing to be Dior's Poison. So a feminine fragrance in the mid-80s that came out, Dior's Poison, of course, is one of the iconic, one of the best tuberose fragrances I've ever smelled. The vintage Esprit de Parfums are stunningly beautiful. Even though that tuberose note makes it a little harder for me to wear than this, um, you know, you get the style. This could have easily been what Poison, you know, was. And Alain Delon, a uh, famous French actor, his brand ended up taking this and creating Akitos. And so they marketed it towards men, but when you smell it, you'll definitely get the, yeah, I'm telling you, the jasmine in this is unbelievable. The jasmine and rose combination is to die for with that. It's a little spicy, but it's very, it's a little musky, leathery, and, and, Animalic. I would not be surprised if there was civet and stuff like that in there, again, to hide that floral bouquet. So that's the backdrop. That's kind of, um, that's the situation that Furio came out in. That's what it was competing against at the time. Oh, God, man. Let me, uh, let me compose myself. So, so that was the trend. Um, and, um, so let's go back to the vintage because I've been talking a lot about the modern. Let's let's kind of take a step back and go back to the uh, vintage. So I mentioned that the civet and just the notes in general, the green touches from Furio, um, the lavender, the florals as well, just seem more 3D, like you can walk around them, like you can pick them up and kind of smell them yourself. Uh, but... The way it smells as the hours tick by is where I think the civet in the vintage really uh, takes control. I think that's where it shines to me. As the hours tick by and as you continue to smell this smoother, 
less synthetic smell to me. Uh, the, the Modern is very synthetic. I have no problem with it. Actually, they're both fairly synthetic fragrances. Um, but in the, uh, in the vintage, as the hours tick by, the civet smells different. And, you know, I know there's a part of the fragrance community that'll be like, look, there was never any civet in Koros. It doesn't matter. Even the vintage Charles of the Ritz version, they used Animalis. They just dosed it a different, you know, bait, whatever, you know, some sort of synthetic accord that's supposed to give off this animalic vibe you know, scatone and civet and all this other stuff that it's supposed to smell pissy and animalic and all this stuff. And I can't say I have any idea what the animalic base is between Furio Vintage and Furio Modern. I don't know. I mean, um, I, I couldn't tell you I know. If I did, I would be lying. But uh, the reality is that there is something as the hours tick by that this civet note tends to kind of present itself as the dominant note as, as the hours tick by. Everything else is still going on, but it's just that civet almost tends to rise in, in, um, in intensity, almost like your body temperature is also heating up while you're wearing it, even if you're not, even if you're just sitting here at a desk like I am talking to you. Uh, as the hours tick by and you smell it, it feels like your body temperature is heating up and it's getting the civet excited, okay? Whereas the... Um, Modern starts to kind of flatline, starts to smell a little bit more even keeled um, and, and all that good stuff. And we'll talk about what the modern turns into deeper into the dry down. But for now, if we go to the vintage, so the uh, civet starts to amp up and the way that I describe it, and I, and I just, this is just something I thought of today. It may seem like a silly ana analogy, but imagine you're walking in the forest and you see a giant mushroom, a big fat mushroom, okay, huge. Uh, whatever mushroom you want it to look like, take, take, take whatever mushroom you have in your head and just visualize a big fat mushroom and, uh, a giant fungus, if you will. And imagine you take a sharp stick and you stick it into that mushroom. Okay. And I want you to take kind of a mental snapshot of what that mushroom in your brain looks like with the stick entering the mushroom. Okay. And the rest of the mushroom shape remaining whole. It's not like you stab the mushroom and it deflates, right? The mushroom um, texture of the mushroom in your mind, you stick the stick in, and you know how mushrooms have that gelatinous, you can kind of move them around, but they're a solid, right? They're not jello, right? They're, they're a solid. You can move it around, but it's a, it's a mushroom. The stick is in the mushroom, but the rest of the mushroom shape is still intact, right? And now imagine that when you poke that mushroom, it released some sort of a gas, okay? And the gas smelled slightly pissy, yellowy, almost pussy. Okay, almost pussy. Um, and a tinge of sweetness to it. Musky-like sweetness. But imagine that sweetness had this animalic 80s honey vibe to it. So, uh, so when you smell it, you get this animalic 80s honey vibe that you'll find in vintage fragrances like this. I mentioned Kor Koros. Um... But also in the early 90s, this came out. I've talked about this before. This absolutely deserves to be thrown in there with the grand 80s animalic fragrances because this came out in 1993 and this is uh, joint by Rocco Barocco, Rocco Barocco, if you prefer. I've always said Rocco Barocco, but Jonathan planted the seed that it, it's probably Rocco, dude. And I was like, yeah, you're probably right, but Rocco Barocco just doesn't sound right all of a sudden after saying Rocco Barocco for so long. So this is joint pour homme. And look at the bottle similarity. Look, these get compared a lot because of how the bottle similarities look. Um, and there is some truth to the comparison. There is. However, um, I must say that, of course, there's also some differences. But if you know joint, and if you like the type of fragrances I'm talking about today... You have to try this if you've never tried it. It absolutely must go on your list. Sebastian actually put this number one as his vintage masculine of all time. I've got two bottles of this, thank God, 100 mil and a 50 mil. And uh, one of my 100, the 100 mil is um, P2 Parfums is the distributor. This one, Hescanas, and I, I'm telling you, it doesn't matter. I'll, I'll do a comparison video probably between the two one day, but just get whatever you can get at this point. Whatever you can get at a fair price, go for it. This is fantastic stuff. Anuj found me this 50 mil. My 100 mil I don't show as much because the name rubbed off as is. You can see kind of the writing starting to rub off. 
Uh, it's apt to do on these old bottles. Um, but if you've smelled the honey way that uh, Joint Pour Homme kind of feels mixed with the civet and, and you know, that kind of thing, you'll, you'll get an idea of that honeyed civet that I'm, that I'm talking about. Um, they both have this animalic honey with civet that tends to come out more in the vintage. So when I say sweetness, imagine a slightly uh, sweetened Koros or Joint Pour Homme honey mixed with that uh, yellowish civet, but imagine that the civet is also part, the mushroom is also part of the civet. Not just the gas that comes out of it, but that texture of the mushroom is what the civet feels like. It almost feels like a gland. You know what I mean? It feels like a gland. Um, and I don't get that in the modern. I don't get that imagery for whatever reason. I've said this before, but the best fragrances to me instantly kind of uh, pop up in this uh, this image in my brain. They just do it. And, and many times I blame myself for not coming up with the image, but in reality, I think I should really start blaming the fragrance. Good fragrances, it just does it for me. You know, the image pops up in my mind. There's no work that has to be done. And that's what the vintage of um, Furio does for me. Now, so the biggest difference to me is as the hours tick by between the vintage and the modern, uh, the vintage is going to come up with this extra sour, animalic, honeyed civet that is absolutely beautiful and I absolutely love it. Um, and, you know, going back to Joint Pour Homme, one thing that they do in Joint Pour Homme is Joint Pour Homme brings in this tobacco note. Beautiful tobacco. Fantastic. I, I adore. Every, every time I get to wear these, it's like a pleasure. Honestly, it is. Uh, I remember I wore this to the dentist one day. And the girl was like, what in the world are you wearing? And I was like, it wouldn't matter if I told you, you wouldn't know it. Um, and it's just, these are the type of fragrances that just elicit a reaction, you know. And even though I'm, for the most part, I'm not someone up here to flex or stunt, or it's not my personality. Honestly, when someone gives me a, a compliment, I always take it in stride. I always just say thank you and very, you know, very polite and, and, um, you know, I, that's just who I am. That's just who I am. I, I, I don't necessarily get embarrassed by the spotlight, but I'm not someone that's out there that's going to kind of rub it in your face. You know what I mean? Um, and these kind of fragrances, you will get attention. There's a hundred percent you'll get the attention. Now, what you do with it, I think is up to you, but you will get the attention of people around you wearing stuff like uh, Joint or, or Furio or Tenere or Koros or Akitos or, and all that good stuff. Um, so, one, the reason I bring up Joint Pour Homme and that tobacco is that the vintage, I noticed, has a little bit of this tobacco-like vibe. A little bit of this, like if I close my eyes, I could almost imagine that there's tobacco in the base mixed with the vetiver. Now, the other thing it has with the tobacco is it has a little slight, if you've ever listened to Persolais talk about vetiver, he always says that vetiver has this celery-like vibe to it. And... In the vintage, you will notice a little bit of this boiled vegetable celery vibe mixing with the animalic honey and civet and all these other notes, the, the florals that I mentioned earlier, the carnation um, and the lavender, which is all there. You know, I don't want to discount any of that. The lavender is a big part. The part that is not as big a part in the vintage is the ambrette. I don't think the ambrette is anywhere near the ambrette that you, you will get in the modern. We'll talk about that too, but just know that a slightly more tobacco nuance comes out in the vintage. Oh, it's just fucking fantastic, man. Okay, so let's go back to the uh, modern. Let's finish this out by going back to the modern. So in the base, what I think they did is uh, they kind of used a similar trick in the modern as what the, let's say, creators of a modern oud fragrance would use to uh, hide the fact that they don't use very much oud, or there's no oud at all, and there's just some black oud or norlimbanol, whatever the hell the notes are to build that oud accord that perfumers use nowadays. Um, so what do they always do? They always amp up a couple things like patchouli or patchoulol or whatever the hell it is. Um, musk, amber, and vetiver. Those are, I think, the trios. That amber uh, patchouli combination feels amped up in the base as the hours tick by. You're not going to notice the, you're not going to notice that sour civet as much as like you would in the, in the modern as you do in the vintage, but 
you'll notice something that is just as equally interesting to me. And that's why I don't think I'm going to be able to pick a favorite. I'm not going to be able to say this is a winner or this is a winner. I'm going to say that I love them both and that I actually want a bottle of the vintage for posterity's sake. I just haven't been able to find it yet, but I want it for the collection is um, the modern uses this um, in the modern you get this note of ambrette and it smells like the ambrette that I know from the last 20 years or so if you know the way that Dior does ambrette Dior does one of the best ambrette notes to me Dior Homme Intense, Dior Homme Parfum, Dior Homme the original they all have a beautiful note of ambrette it's ambrette and iris and that was uh, kind of formed by um, uh, Bois d'Argent Okay, like a year before Dior Homme came out, Bois d'Argent came out, and that formed the foundation of Dior Homme with that Ambrette Iris thing going on. And they've used Ambrette many a times, Dior has. Most notably, probably, or the most recent one that I can kind of point to is this little bad boy. And this has, this is just a decant, so there's no name on the bottle. But this is a fragrance called Santal Noir. And Santal Noir is one of the privés from Dior, came out in 2018, I believe. Uh, let's see, when did you come out? Santal Noir, 2018, yes. Uh, and it's Turkish Rose, Ambrette, and Sandalwood. Beautiful, just easy combination. Uh, reminds me a little bit of Santal Majuscule, but with that Dior Ambrette thing going on, right? And so the Ambrette here, oh, so I'm gonna make an outrageous statement, okay? If you like Dior Homme, if you like the way Dior does Ambrette, Okay, and I know Dior Homme and Furio are a million miles away. Try to get the mo modern. Try to get the modern of Furio. The Ambrette in here is absolutely jaw-droppingly beautiful. This punch is so high above its weight class. For 28 Canadian dollars, which is like 20 bucks in the US, you cannot find a fragrance like this. Not in a million years. Not in an absolute million years. This would be a niche fragrance for 300 bucks today, easily. Easily, hands down. Um, that's another reason that I love vintage so much is where else for $20 can I get a fragrance that keeps my interest like this does? You know, even after years of owning this, uh, I'm still discovering things, taken back by things. Uh, smelling the vintage was a revelation. I, uh, I've always wanted a bottle because I want it. Now I want a bottle because I know I, I kind of understand some of the differences and I want a vintage bottle of Furio with the 85 proof volume on the front. It's just a matter of finding one. I'm sure someone out there in the fragrance community has a partial or something they'd be willing to sell me. If I uncover it one day, you'll see it added to the collection for sure. So, but this Ambrette is so beautiful. You know, Ambrette was used as like a Sorry, Ambrette was used as like a um, musk uh, replacement, right? It's pretty expensive to use. It's a um, hibiscus seed, I think is what actually creates Ambrette, if I'm not mistaken. And I love the note. I think it's I think it's deep. It's uh, it's a plant based. It's almost like a plant based musk, right? For those of, for those of you that don't want to use real musk or you don't like the synthetic musk, they used to use Ambrette as a musk replacer. Now it's just too expensive to do that, so they do it because it has its own scent profile, and it's very interesting. I am a huge fan of Ambrette, and the Ambrette that comes out in the modern you will not get in the in the vintage. You won't. Um, you won't get that Ambrette style. So the vintage has that civet that I love. The modern has that Ambrette that I love. And they kind of both give me little different facets. I mean, it's clearly the same fa fragrance. Uh, there's no doubt about it. It's a fantastic reformulation. But I don't think I could pick a winner. I think I uh, would just have to... I think I would just have to want to own them both, honestly. So, so yes, I am. Uh, I hope this video has helped. I know it was very detailed. This is for the fragrance nerds in us. Uh, this is this is for the people that really want to take the next step in the in the fragrance journey. And th those are the kind of people that I think are gravitating towards my channel. So um, I really appreciate everyone watching. If you like this kind of video, do li leave a thumbs up. It does help the algorithm whenever it makes recommendations to people. Uh, and I want more people that are like-minded. I want more people who are, um, you know, 
who are deep into the fragrance game, they're not just using fragrance to get popular on YouTube, or they're not just using it to make money, you know, or they're not just using it to flex on people. They're using it because they absolutely love fragrance as an art form. Those are the people I want subscribed to my channel. And I hope this video has been interesting and different and helpful. And I love doing these comparisons. I still have a ton of comparison videos still to do. And so um, hopefully we'll be able to knock out a blind sniffing live stream tonight. If you guys can join, it would be fantastic. It'll probably be sometime in the evening tonight, you know, eight, nine, 10 o'clock central standard time. Um, and so yes, thanks for watching everybody. Do leave a comment. Cheers. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.